Well, on this Frigid Signature Style Saturday, let's answer that riveting question. How are we going to entertain ourselves inside when it's cold all weekend long? Well, first of all, let's be productive and let's restore some of our weather-worn boots and see what we can do to freshen them up a little bit. Let's talk about some books to read, some movies to watch, um, some podcasts to listen to. Let's Let's talk a little bit about some not life luxuries but life necessities right now to help us make it through cold and flu season. Am I forgetting anything guys? Uh, oh, and answer lots of your questions because they have been piling up. So what do you say guys? Let's do it. Well, if you guys have followed me for any period of time, you know that I am a girl who loves her boots and more specifically loves her hunter boots though really any kind of gardening boots in general are just wonderful for this time of year when it's cold it's mucky um, it's muddy you're working in the garden or you're just actually wearing them out and about so i have had some of my my pairs of boots i think both of these pair of hunter boots i've had for 20 plus years and I think I've had them for so long because I do try to take pretty good care of them and give them a little bit of TLC. Now, if you are new to the Hunter Garden Boot world, or if you're not new to it, you probably have, no, have noticed that it gets this kind of a white cast. And this isn't just on your Hunter boots. It can be on any kind of rubber boots, your high C boots, really any, any type of boots that have a material that when exposed to different kinds of elements to to salt, to mud, to wind, to snow, whatever, the insoluble particles of that material kind of rise to the surface and they create this white veneer called bloom. Now it's not too serious, it's very very easy to remove and here's how. First, you want to really wipe down the boots, clean them very, very well to get any kind of topical dirt, any kind of residual mud or anything like that that's on the surface of the boot itself. You want to clean that off. And then it is literally this simple. And you can see the difference between this boot that I just finished applying this magic elixir to and this one that hasn't received the treatment yet. And really all you do is you just take a rag and a little bit of olive oil and you just start rubbing it on the surface of the boot. And I actually put a couple of coats on that other one kind of let it sink in I don't know this you know rubber isn't necessarily a porous material so I'm not sure if it stays on the surface or it might soak in a little bit but just because I will do a couple of rounds to remove the bloom on these boots and when you're finished they really do almost look brand new now, in addition to this treatment, I am also going to take this pair to my cobbler. And Leah and I have the same cobbler or the same shoe person that, that really works and restores our cowboy boots, our favorite garden boots, things like that. Um, puts additional holes in your belt if you don't have a belt leather puncher um, but look at how beautiful that looks but as I started to say this one this pair has a buckle gone bad and so I am going to take that to my cobbler to see if he can do anything about it and maybe be as effective as I have been in restoring the cherry red sheen to these hunter boots this is a great thing to do on a really cold dreary weekend when the temperatures are way too bitter to be outside and garden and goodness knows i have enough pairs of boots that they all could use this de-blooming treatment 
Well, there is lots of watching and there's lots of reading going on this weekend in the cottage on this very, very frigid uh, mid-January weekend. So I thought I would share with you some of the books that I'm reading that I'm so enjoying. Some oldies, uh, but also some new new um, oh, new fiction, starting with a book called Running in the Family by Michael Ujanji. And here we're just going to have to put up an image, um, a graphical display of this because I actually rented it from the library or borrowed it from the library and I'm reading it on my Libby app. It is just really wonderful. It reminds me a little bit of Gabriel Marcia Marquez. It's a little bit phantasmagorical, um, if that's a word, but I think you'll really enjoy it. The writing is just exquisite. Um, then on a lighter note, I am revisiting some oldies but goodies. Some of them you might still be able to find. We will try to locate some links to these and put them in the description box below. One of them is Seasonal Home by Kristen Perez. These are books that I have had, uh, I mean, I have had them forever, but I really love books that are seasonally categorized and they give me some digestible ideas, still lifes, just really moments of beauty for each season. So that's one. And then there are a couple of other books. Both of these are part of the small book series. One is The White Home. You guys may be familiar with these by Carolyn Clifton Mogg. This is, this is an oldie, but it's really, really lovely. And I find extremely classic. The images are very classic, as is the the styling and the decor so I think you'll enjoy it and the other one you can see that I have really tagged lots of stuff in here this one is called the natural home stylish living inspired by nature you guys know I'm all about that in my garden inspired life this one is by Judith Wilson so we will definitely put these links below and I highly recommend all of them you might look for them on eBay at your used bookstore online someplace and certainly if they are available for through some kind of online retailer we'll try to find that link for you and then what I am watching. Well, I I have started watching the series. I think it's on, is it on Netflix, Stuart? This is Us. I believe it's on Netflix. This is a series that has been around for a while. Highly, highly acclaimed, but I had not seen it. And so Hubs and I are just watching a season or an episode or two of the first season each night. It's kind of a fun thing to do. We snuggle up by the fire and watch it. It's very, very good. It does not disappoint and it is living up to its acclaim. So if you have not watched that, I highly Highly recommend it. Stuart keeps trying to inadvertently. He's giving us some clues as to as to what's going to happen, and we don't want him to. So Lee and I keep saying, "No, Stuart, no, it's no, such no." A good show. It really is a good show. Yeah. Um, another really fun movie that I watched. Um, I. I think it, it might have been on Prime, and that was The Bank of Dave. Have you seen that movie? It was so heartwarming, uplifting, inspirational. It was every man becomes a hero kind of story, kind of tale, and I just loved it. So if you want a feel-good movie, I highly recommend uh, the Bank of Dave. And then I also watched a real, real oldie, um, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway that had Vanessa Redgrave in it. It was really good. Um, I don't think I had seen that version before. I had seen The Hours based on Woolf's, um, on Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, but I had not seen this. And I highly recommend it too if you want to go back in time. And I think that was maybe on the freebie app. So those are just a couple of things that I'm reading and watching. And then there were a couple of articles that also I found very interesting, and we will make sure to put the links below. Um, one was an article um, that my sister sent me on synesthesia. And you guys know that I am someone who has synesthesia, and that's where different parts of my brain kind of oh, they just kind of overlap, and there is some um, passage between two different parts of your brain. So I have a weird tendency to, uh, to do things like every letter to me is a color, every number is a color, some of them have gender, 
and that's an example of synesthesia. So that's a fun article to read. And then another one that um, was written by a British gardener, what every gardener needs to know about the viral three-hour warning. That was the title of it when it was in a Good Housekeeping article. And it's based on the premise that to protect yourself from the sun, and especially now with, uh, with our temperatures being so, so extreme, and I noticed it this year, since I have so much more sun exposure than I did at my other house, um, that those pivotal hours between 11 and 2, really, we are best to avoid them in general. We are best to stay in from the sun and really do our gardening at other times of day. And this is a fascinating art article that makes that argument. So those are just a few things that I am reading and watching and listening to in this cold January. Well, in all of the chaos of the holidays and the fact that I got sick shortly thereafter, a number of you pointed out to me that we had not announced the color of the month. Well, the color of the month is this beautiful, light, almost steely gray. I find myself gravitating towards it lately, and I've been wearing lots of things in this hue, notably my new North Face Puffer jacket that Hubs got me for my birthday. So there is your color of the month light steel gray now i know lots of us are doing dry january we're doing no spend january or no spend february but i still wanted to share some little life luxuries with you if you will because i really think of them as little life necessities that right now will really help you make it through cold and flu season and this bitter arctic front that we have coming through goodness knows they have helped me make it through my most recent bout with a really hideous cold so number one and i got this at your instruction this was a follower recommended thing you guys told me being the good moms that you are you mothered me and you told me that i really needed to get a humidifier this just arrived I haven't even set it up yet I got it because I like the fact that you put the water in the um, in the cavern at the top and I really like that so it'll be easy to access easy to fill and it was highly reviewed um, and so thank you guys for that because the air has been so incredibly dry my skin is starting to to crack um, house plants are starting to suffer so definitely in general I needed a humidifier I got this one it's small and compact and thank you guys for the recommendation so I guess this is a follower recommendation um, number two this is a hubs recommendation because in this older neighborhood our electricity frequently goes out and for that matter even in newer neighborhoods if we get an ice storm if we get a snowstorm anything like that it can compromise the grid and we could lose our power so hubs said that I tell you guys about this battery pack it's a Med Metastrom, Metastrom battery pack. And why he likes it is he is very, very reliant on his CPAP machine. And he cannot get a good night's sleep if, his, if the power goes out and he can't use his CPAP. So he got one of these batteries. They're not inexpensive, but they are ever so valuable because then he can just plug in his device into this. It also have has a, a USB outlet here so that you can charge your phone if you are not using it for other purposes. It has um, a, a kind of a metric on here that shows you, yeah, a display showing you how much charge it has. But he has two of these actually, and they have saved us on I don't know how many different occasions. He also uses it sometimes when he goes camping. So you might want to take a look at this. I think it's something that if you too or you have a loved one who is reliant on a CPAP or some other kind of medical device that requires electricity or power that you look into this. I highly recommend it. I will put links to both of these below. Um, 
I don't know, I've, I've talked about this before, but I just didn't know how truly, truly valuable it was until I got sick. And this is one of those heated throws. I've recommended this before. I recommended it as a Christmas gift. It would make a brilliant Valentine's gift. Um, so even if you're trying to be thrifty, if you know someone who is really down and out and unwell, it is so comforting to have one of these electrical throws, electrical throw blankets. You can take it with you if you are cuddled in front of the fire and watching TV. I a lot of times keep it in my lap when I'm sitting at my desk and if I am just taking a nap during the day or something, which is infrequent, but nevertheless, when I've been sick, I take one of these, use one of these, and it is just really invaluable. So we will put a link to one of these below. I cannot recommend them highly enough. Again, I would say not necessarily a luxury, but a real necessity if you are down and out. And then finally, this definitely is not a necessity, but it did lift my spirits after being sick. And that was, I wanted, I've had one of these for years. I, I consider it kind of a, of a French t-shirt, a French striped t-shirt with this bateau, bateau neck. And I needed a new one and I just bought myself one. And next week we're going to show you maybe four or five different ways that you can style this, wearing it now in the winter time and then also how it can segue easily into the spring. And this was just something that I needed as kind of a mood lift. So there are a few things that you might want to look into and definitely, definitely as we go into this Arctic front, please make sure that you're prepared that you have candles on hand, that you have um, fresh water, that you have access to all of the things that you need when the power goes out. Here's a little pitch for my garden journal because this is exactly the type of thing that you want to record in your garden journal and that is when we have epically low temperatures like we're getting ready to experience this weekend. You'll definitely want to record that in your garden journal. Speaking of garden journals, I am going to gift one to my friend Jenna who gave me some delicious kale greens and some eggs um, that we're going to be cooking up tomorrow. But I also think it gives any gardener in your life and makes a really good garden gift. But I also want to give a shout out to, and what was her name, Leah? Yellow Door Ranch. Yellow Door Ranch, who did, who gave, such a brilliant idea. I should have thought of it myself. And I don't know if it was her who did it or, or one of her littles or something who did it. And they colored in some of the illustrations inside the garden journal. I don't know if it was with colored pencils. You could use watercolors. But what an absolutely brilliant idea. We'll put up a still right here of what she did. And I thought, oh my goodness, how much more of a keepsake would that make this garden journal if you had your children or your grandchildren or anyone really color in some of the illustrations here, date it, have them initial it, and it would very much be a part of their growing up as well as a record of the garden itself. I just think that's a wonderful, wonderful idea. And if you haven't ordered the garden journal, then I sincerely hope that you do, and we'll put a link in the description box below. Well, it has been quite a while since I have answered any of our viewer questions and Leah has assembled a number of them. I don't know what they are and hopefully I'll have an answer. <laughs> so, so Leah, take it away. Okay, this one goes with some of the things we filmed today. Someone said, I love Linda's red garden boots. What is the purpose for such high boots? Is it comfort, trying not to get bit by snakes? The boots must be hot in her part of the U.S. in okay. the summer. Okay, they are, they are hunter boots, 
and yes they are tall and probably in the dead of summer I don't wear them but in the spring in the fall in the winter I definitely do and part of the reason is because they really cover not only and, and they're waterproof so they not only protect my feet from the cold and and the wet but they do it all the way up to my knee it's not because of snakes it's not because of some other things but what i like about them and here's here's an an example of why I like them. Have you ever been potting up something or you've been digging something or you're transplanting something and all of a sudden you've got this big wad of dirt and the wad of dirt goes right into your garden shoes? <laughs> That happens to me all of the time. And so the taller boots, that's not so much of a problem. Um, also, a lot of times I am walking in, not so much in this garden, but in my other garden, kind of thick underbrush. And because of that, there might be ticks, there might be bugs, there might be uh, poison ivy, there might be anything that would give me a rash. And so I'm just used to wearing them. And so, yes, that's why I wear them. And I not only wear them in the garden, I wear them out and about. Um, I've had them for years. I just, I like the way they look. I'm comfortable in them, even, even if it's sometimes a little bit warm. Love it. Okay. okay. I'll Number give two. this to you. Our friend Casey asked, could Linda please get, give more detailed info on her non-wired outdoor lights, which I just passed that over to you. Okay. Mounted so, to the brick garage walls. Okay. So I think when I was doing the backyard, I told you that I wanted some carriage lights on either side of the garage window and also on one side of the garage door, the, pa the, the door going leading down into, into the garage. And there was no electricity there. It would have been cost prohibitive to have added it. Would I still like to have electrical there? Yes, I would, but I preferred to spend my money on other things. And I had an alternative, and that alternative are these um, Neparol Magic Glow light bulbs. So you can see right here that they are rechargeable. And these are not only the bulbs that I use in those fixtures. And by the way, the fixtures were true light fixtures that were meant to be hardwired into uh, into the facade, but I didn't want to do that. So basically, we just took out the workings, and they just had whatever the assemblage is that you screw the light bulb into it. So these work brilliantly. They come with a remote, so you can use them from indoors and turn them and turn them on. These also, I used to have puck lights in the sconces that hang in uh, near my kitchen table and those just they just proved problematic to get in and get out so I've switched them out for these now one thing I have done recently is I um, treated myself to a number of backups of these so I always have some ready waiting and charged so whenever whenever anything goes out I have one at the ready that I can just screw back in the other thing that I have noticed because all of these they don't have the advantage of electricity um, and one thing that I have noticed is do take advantage of the feature on the remote control where you can do them at 50% or 100% which affects the longe longevity of the battery life but you can also do it for blocks of time so for one hour two hours three hours or whatever so if you're not wanting to have them on for a prolonged period of time you might want to use that feature but I think they are great my recommendation would just be to have backups so that you are not never without illumination where you want it. Love it. Okay. This follower from YouTube says, I'm thinking of starting a YouTube garden channel. Do you have any advice? Love your channel. Um, so many people are wanting to start YouTube channels about all sorts of different things and there definitely is a learning curve to it and a lot more detail than I could certainly supply right here. Maybe, I don't know, what do you guys think? Maybe sometime I need to do a whole show just on how I got into doing what it is I do. Um, the evolution of the different platforms that I've been on 
how I am doing this now because I'm sure you can you can probably Google how to start a YouTube channel um, and there are some, probably some good YouTubes on that uh, but my personal story would be a little bit different so that I may be sidestepping that but um, but we'll think about doing that that's okay there's a question of the day if you guys would like me to share what my my pilgrimage has been to the YouTube channel please let me know and and we'll talk about it be a fun video. okay Be before you ask me another question I've got an answer to a question what is this gorgeous blooming <laughs> color blends amaryllis here well, this is Dancing Queen. We need to put some ABBA music up right here. This is the beautiful Dancing Queen. You may recall, recall that we had a competition. Now, Leah did send me a picture of hers. Mm -hmm. Or did you give it to your mom as a gift? I gave it to my mom on Christmas. And I, she sent me a picture. It made her so happy when it started blooming. And it, and it looks every bit as beautiful as this. So right now, Stuart is hanging his head in shame because he did not even pot his up. I mean, I got so many good plants at home. I'm taking pictures. So, well, okay. Oh, okay. Is it too late? Is, is it, it too, too late? late to plant it? Absolutely not. Uh -huh. So if you still have an amaryllis bulb that has been stored appropriately and hasn't started to go squishy um, and, and hasn't started to rot, then absolutely. You can still pot it up. Do that now. You might want to really hydrate the roots first before you put it in potting soil, and then you will probably have it blooming for Valentine's Day. You'll have a dancing queen at Valentine's Day. Love okay, it. one last question. One or two more. Okay, last one. Someone asked, why are you planting on the neighbor's side of the alley? It would be kind of you to ask them if you haven't. You mentioned it grows weeds. Can you even see it from where you live? Okay, so this is probably referencing the hollyhocks that I planted behind the fence um, of my neighbor uh, Lori's. Well, number one, uh, I'll bristle a little bit here because the the follower may have assumed I didn't ask her. <laughs> um, I first of all, she's a very good friend of mine. I know she would be thrilled, and yes, indeed, I did ask her. But she will be thrilled when there are hollyhocks blooming in the alley if they if my gardening risk worth taking comes to fruition. Um, number two, I'm not even sure that that would have been, yes, it was not right behind my, my cottage, but I'm not even sure that's on anyone's, technically on anyone's property because alleys are just kind of public places. And, um, and you know what, even, even if it were, that's a gardening risk I would be willing to take because to me, there's not much downside. If somebody, you know, let's say a curmudgeon lived there and they didn't want me to plant hollyhocks back there um, and they wanted me to rip them out, then I would rip them out to make them happy. But um, yeah, for those of you that were concerned that that wasn't on my property, um, you know, I think that's a little bit splitting hairs. It's in an alley um, and lots of weeds are growing on my property that I didn't plant. And so I, I, I think it falls into the category of beautification. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. Um, I will also answer another question that so many of you had when I was talking about harvesting or foraging my free mulch um, out of the gutter. So number one, I, I should have I should have prefaced it by saying that I have done that for years at my other house um, in Crown Heights where there would be lots of, of um, things that had just, well, they had just worn down with time, organic material that was in the gutter that had worn down over time and I would use it for mulch. And some of you were afraid that it might have it might have fumes or oils or residual chemical products in it from cars and things. Well, these are neighborhood streets that aren't that heavily traveled. Again, I'm not getting the things out from the middle of the road. I'm getting them out from the edge of neighborhood streets. Um, yes, I guess a dog could have peed on it, um, but a dog could also have peed on the lettuce that I've planted, and a cat could have peed on the lettuce that I've got planted in my, in my vegetable garden in the back. 
Um, so those are those are legitimate concerns. But again, I I just fall back on experience, and it was it's a practice that I've done for years without any negative effects. So I think I'm going to keep doing it. Um, and and yes, I guess I could have taken some of that debris from. Um, the medium or from the sidewalk in front of my neighbor's yard, but then you would have worried if I was taking <laughs> if I was taking debris from in front of my neighbor's yard. So I don't want to be insensitive to those concerns, um, but I'm just living my life and I'm using what's available to me. And on the contrary, rather than having any kind of negative response, I've only had positive ones from people who say, oh, well, what are you doing? And I will say, oh, I'm gathering some free mulch because we're getting ready to freeze. And if you have any tender plants, here's some free mulch that you might wanna take advantage of too. So again, if it were a highway, if it were a heavily trafficked area, the other thing is in Oklahoma, the wind is blowing this stuff around <laughs> pretty frequently. So nothing is going to stay in the gutter really that long for it to absorb too many toxins. So I guess that's my answer. That's my answer to a lot of you who had concerns, justifiable concerns. Um, but I guess that's my response to that. Any other? That Any other good. questions it's there? Beautifying the neighborhood. Beautifying the neighborhood where there will be lots of questions I know is when we do our next Linda Vodder Live, we're going to be doing that on January 21st at 2 o'clock Central Standard Time. Check your time zones. We're going to be doing lots of fun giveaways. We're going to be giving away some high sea boots, some Anacora honey, some cool job gloves. I'm not sure if, if Southern Living is participating, but lots of people are. It's going to be a lot of fun and why are we doing this to celebrate our thousandth video on YouTube so I hope you guys save up your questions for for that event also your comments and I certainly hope we see you then take care <laughs>